Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the security and privacy session at the DHS2 annual conference. Uh, we have very, my name is Michael and I'm security lead for DHS2 and we have uh, three, four different talks today. They cover absolutely different topics uh, related to security, privacy, compliance and a bit wider technology. So uh, if you're not interested in the first one, maybe the second, third or fourth will be more relevant. And uh, that was intentional. We tried to cherry pick the best, uh, most interesting topics to highlight. And uh, as the sh session is generally very short, um, you can ask the questions right after each session, or there will be some time left afterwards. So you can talk to us and ask your more detailed questions or have a, just a chat about any security privacy topics afterwards. We have two speakers here in the room and two speakers remotely. And uh, we'll start with Upendra, who is our first speaker, and will tell us a bit more about his experience with biometrics. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. So can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. So shall I start? OK, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Upendra Sreshta. I'm uh, working as a, a senior monitoring and evaluation specialist for uh, FSI Nepal. So, uh, so on behalf of uh, my uh, bunch of uh, team members, I'm going to present on our uh, piece of work on assessing the uh, accessibility and feasibility of the biometric integration uh, in DHIS2 at the community level. So Nepal is experience, uh, experiencing a concentrated epidemic of HIV. Uh, basically, the HIV prevalence is high among uh, uh, certain key populations, such as uh, female sex workers, uh, men having sex with men, and transgender people. So uh, FHI 360 in Nepal uh, mainly works with these populations. So uh, why the so if we if we uh, uh, like uh, the mobile nature of uh, these populations uh, becomes more complex uh, to like uh, uh, further, uh, like uh, the mobile nature of uh, these population has further made the unique identification more complex. Uh, so therefore, uh, therefore we like in perspective of program matic implementation, it is uh, more important to identify those uh, duplications and uh, work on those uh, duplication to make program more efficient and effective. So a uh, unique client is more important to enable HIV prevention, treatment, care, and support uh, program. Yes, it is uh, very important so that uh, our resource mobilization and uh, can be done effectively and efficiently to reach out uh, those populations so basically nepal uh, has been uh, like uh, the client code is basically formulated on the basis of uh, certain uh, demographic informations uh, uh, demographic data such as uh, last name and uh, birth of uh, birth birth year and uh, the code related to their sex and their service numbers which is uh, like uh, maybe more common uh, and 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 if if uh, those uh, demographic information and data given by the client uh, uh, like is is not consistent so that uh, that may that may uh, like uh, there may be a chance of uh, being duplication in the program uh, services so so it is uh, more uh, important to integrate that uh, client code with the biometric system so that the client, the duplication in the service uh, reach can be triggered and identified uh, those client at one time across the, uh, within the districts or across the service program. So, uh, okay. Then next uh, one is, uh, at national level, we have already uh, implemented biometric system at the close setting uh, for among those who are taking ART treatments. 
and uh, and uh, and the coverage is almost ninety uh, percent uh, for those who are taking uh, antiretroviral treatment services at ART sites. So basically, uh, we don't have any like uh, we don't know uh, how people going to like accept. Uh, or the integration would be feasible at community level. So uh, our our uh, work on like EPIC Nepal, FHI 360 carried out a small uh, scale intervention to determine uh, the feasibility and acceptability of biometric integration at community level among uh, these populations. So this is the this is the main workflow of the system. First, we develop uh, Android-based applications that can uh, be used to capture fingerprint uh, from the of the clients, and uh, a Kotlin-based Android application with Android sec security crypto for secure uh, fingerprint matching, uh, integrated with the uh, TI TI of the clients was developed. And using that application, uh, we capture fingerprint from Android devices. And uh, local database is our uh, Android devices. First, the data is stored uh, at the local database, that is uh, Android devices. And we uh, establish middleware to prevent the uh, to prevent the direct hit to the server database. So first, we downloaded uh, and uh, downloaded some of the sync. First, we synced uh, some of the uh, like uh, client TEI and other de uh, certain demographic information such as uh, client code and uh, uh, their their specific uh, demographic information such as uh, sex and uh, service number. We first sync. Uh, in our middleware, and and the when when we uh, capture their fingerprint, the uh, TI is synced with the fingerprint, and ultimately uh, the it is stored in middleware, and when the when the internet uh, service was there, it directly synced with server database and the biometric fingerprint encrypted in uh, alphanumeric code is also encrypted in DHIS2 uh, under the same TEI. So this is the basic uh, workflow of the system. We implemented uh, the biometric system in uh, four, sorry, in uh, six district, working district out of uh, 37 districts. So basically, uh, basically, uh, the we collected fingerprint for uh, three years. Uh, sorry, three months, March to June, and we uh, applied mixed methodologies uh, such as quantitative and qualitative uh, tools to collect the feedback from the beneficiaries. So for uh, quantitative. We use standard questionnaire to gather feedback from service provider and clients. And for uh, qualitative, we conducted uh, key key interviews, key informant interviews to collect qualitative quant qualitative feedback. So, uh, so after development of uh, standard check uh, tools for the assessment we also conducted a uh, in person training uh, to our community workers known as community based supporters and peer navigators to on the process of capturing biometric and we also oriented them how to how to use uh, tools to collect the feedback from clients and the uh, other service provider. We also like uh, 
uh, for their backstopping, we also train their uh, ME officers for their uh, as a local backstopping at their uh, sites. So there are two basically two uh, enrollment scenarios in the system. Uh, first, first uh, the biometric capture at the time of new registration, and another one is uh, the update of biometric system in the existing client records. So these are two uh, scenarios that was implemented uh, to capture the biometric uh, in the system. So uh, after enrollment, uh, we like uh, after the enrollment of a biometric in the system, uh, the, the, uh, the duplication was triggered. So these are the uh, basic thematic area for uh, analysis. We analyze uh, the their feedbacks in uh, three thematic areas, like client perspective and the confidentiality and physical comfortness, willingness and reluctancy and perceived harm and uh, risks are the main domains for the analysis, such as uh, similarly, uh, we have another uh, thematic area for service provide uh, to collect the uh, feedback from service provider. So basically, uh, in service provider perspective, we use use of information uh, and the difficulty or easiness to use the device and service provider client relationship are the major domains for the analysis. And uh, similarly, we uh the system related domains a th uh, thematic area is another one for the analysis so uh within the implemented period that is 3 months we receive uh we reach 3767 clients in the 3 months of period and among them only 20% uh, where uh, we were able to offer fingerprinting for him. Basically, the gap is due to the internet accessibility at the site where the client were reached. And another one is the uh, time taken to solve the troubleshooting in the system. So if we see the uh, those uh, the second bar and third bar, the almost all uh, beneficiary were agreed and agreed for fingerprinting and their fingerprints were collected. So, so among those uh, fingerprints were collected, 88% uh, provided their feedback on biometric integrations. So our uh, main uh, denominator for analysis is 660. So we use a uh, statistical analysis for uh, those who accepted for biometric, uh, like uh, we, uh, in 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 that uh, three domains, we collected data on uh, yeah ordinary scale, and the uh, the the ranges is from strongly disagree and to strongly agree, and uh, we applied a single sample wheel correction assigned rank test. To, to interpret uh, the acceptability and feasibility of the biometric system. So, so, uh, sorry. So, so the our statistical analysis revealed that uh, there is a uh, acceptability and feasibility of the device at the community. So, uh, in our uh, qu uh, qualitative fi uh, findings. Uh, we collected the client perspective uh, about the biometric uh, use at the community level. So some of the uh, clients were uh, so confident uh, of providing the bio, uh, fingerprint through the um, through through the uh, that fingerprint device and using the uh, mobile applications. So uh, we also found that we also found that uh, the sum of the like 
with proper uh, orientation to the uh, those who service providers and they they took the consent from uh, consent from beneficiary before uh, before taking fingerprinting printing so that will be like uh, th uh, that was uh, like th the proper communication between service provider and uh, client was also uh, helpful to collect uh, biometric and uh, and uh, we also found that uh, the bio the uh, biometric so uh, one of the client uh, uh, respond that i live in a community where there is a close community so if they had seen taking the fingerprint they would be ask me the reason so it is not safe in the community it is better to take the fingerprint in close setting so some of the uh, responses were like that uh, that uh, which uh, recommended that the biometric uh, would be performed at the secure very secure places rather than the open uh, spaces so uh, in provider perspective uh, the most of the providers were uh, taking that it is very beneficial to verify the clients and the community could be checked uh, for duplication in any part of country and within the project or across the project project area so uh, and some of the some of the some of the service provider were also faced the problem in capturing the biometric system due to the uh, problem in the uh, biometric system and internet facilities at the place when uh, they are taking uh, fingerprint they were taking fingerprint at the community so uh, some of the uh, service provider also face uh, practical challenges such as the uh, we need to bring uh, uh, android devices and biometric devices and there were some uh, like and with those uh, all the uh, gadgets uh, some some of the uh, community people blaming so of the gadgets and more of the community were more attentive at the time uh, seeing that all gadgets so these were the uh, most of the the qualitative findings were there this kind of quality uh, findings so in conclusion uh, the biometric integration at uh, community level is uh, is feasible and can be uh, scale up at national level considering the uh, the secured uninterrupted internet connection and uh, the the secure place uh, ensu and ensuring the secure place for conducting the fingerprinting at the community so uh, these are the things to be con uh, considered as considered to scale up biometric at the community we need android travel uh, tablets with features of uh, wi-fi and uh, and there must be uh, like uh, more alternatives to ensure the internet connectivity so that uh, at any place the internet connection would be there so another one is biometric device uh, and we use zk 9500 uh, which is aligned with the national system that national system is the using uh, using same biometric devices and we also need uh, the connector with uh, android device and biometric device so there should be a simplification uh, in uh, capturing fingerprint process which needs to be more user friendly and instant technical support is uh, required for troubleshooting so that uh, the biometric coverage would be improved and uh, there should be proper guidance uh, on the concept consent note to the community staff while seeking the approval from client and similarly we need to find out the secure place to carry out the biometric capture at the community so that the confidentiality and privacy could be maintained so as of now uh, we are able to 
uh, we are able to coordinate with uh, at national level to scale up the uh, biometric. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to implement the uh, biometric at community level uh, within two, three months. So next two, three months, uh, we'll be implementing a biometric system at the community level. So this is our uh, progress so far. So thank you so much. So if you have any query. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to find out, did you have to implement any laws to use the biometric uh, thing? Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, actually, if we take consent from client, it can be it can be used, and by law, it is allowable to take uh, fingerprinting. And if we see at national level, it is already has been uh, start up, started up, so we can use it. So, with consent from the client. You have mentioned that uh, you have used uh, ZK9500. Why you are not using any built-in uh, biometric device with, uh, with that the tablet or the mobile? Have you tested that as well, or is there an issue? Yeah, actually, actually, uh, we are uh, like there. There has already been a system using uh, ZK9500 at national level. So we, uh, our our plan is to integrate the system from community to national level. So, so, so we use the same device uh, what has been using at national level, so that there won't be any uh, compatibility issue. Thanks a lot for the presentation and. Just have a question. You had two use cases there. I saw you had enrollment for new patients and yeah. you didn't update uh, the biometric template. I was just wondering um, in what instances or what use case w would it be for update updating the existing templates? I can see you have new registration, which I assume is for a new. Yes. And then update existing. So in which case? You would use updating. The yeah, template. our our system has already uh, been uh, used to capture individual records. So there are so many records, individual records in the system already there. So if we uh, reach old clients, old clients uh, whose uh, whose records are already been stored in the system. So in that case, if we uh, reach the old clients. So, so for them, the second scenario is applied. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry. You didn't wait. The biometric works for. Yeah, we applied uh, that biometric integration at a community for three months, three months of period. Is of uh, so basically we reached uh, we reached a uh, key population of HIV that comes uh, female sex worker and MSM and most of them were were more than fifteen years. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering if you had any cases where clients were worried about giving their fingerprints or perhaps said, no, I don't want to give you my biometrics. Um, has this happened? And if so, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I saw this result. So so among those who uh, offered fingerprinting and almost all were agreed and for fingerprint collection. So we have only, I think we have only one case that rejected for fingerprinting.
Thanks. Um, great presentation. Super interesting. Lots to learn. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about privacy and data security? Because this is uh, biometrics, very sensitive technology, right? Fingerprints, very sensitive stuff. Do you want to talk a bit more about the privacy and data security measures you've got in place on top of just, you know, taking informed consent? Yeah, for the uh, secure stories of the biometric data, we place uh, the um, those data in a very secure server. So basically, after uh, scale up it at national level, the those data will be in the custody of national custody. So national uh, HIV program. So uh, and these data will not be like uh, used for any other purposes rather than the uh, HIV program. So we ensure that kind of like settings for. Yeah, actually, actually, it is uh, not in the cloud. It's uh, it will be like uh, we tested in very uh, secure, secure server using very secure server. So after scaling up it, uh, it at national level, it will be under uh, government custody. So it is not in the cloud in local. Very secure uh, server. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, my question is not uh, mainly targeting you, but uh, at the with Austin's team. I'm wondering if uh, there has been any thought towards uh, having some encryption options for data elements, because in some tracker instances, you may have, uh, for example, we saw blowout details that you don't want to be visible. So I don't know if. Uh, there has been any thoughts on having that option for data elements. Question comes. I was just here to listen, but um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, so definitely something that uh, we've been talking about. Actually, Michael can probably be, speak to this a bit as well. Um, but we do have uh, some very rudimentary uh, functionality for confidentiality in uh, tracker data um, that I think could be significantly improved. Um, and we've talked about a few different kind of aspects of, of what it would mean to to secure that data. Encryption is is one thing, but that's that's actually a little bit difficult because if you're if you need to expose it to some people, the encryption key needs to leave live somewhere on the server anyway. So then what, are, what is really the value of, of that type of encryption? But being able to uh, limit the exposure to people that are doing analytics, for example, to prevent certain attributes from being analyzed, uh, to be able to uh, have more fine gain control of who, uh, and maybe audited control of who has access to different data within the tracker program. Uh, definitely something that we are, are thinking a lot about and the tracker team can, can talk a little more about that. I don't know, Michael, if you wanna share any more. Couple of notes about that. Uh, as Austin mentioned, encryption is not only about just taking data and encrypted data. It's also thinking about uh, who we are protecting from or who is the kind of a threat actor here. Because on one level, we can say, okay, the data is in the data center on the server, and the whole uh, the entire hard disk is encrypted. So we definitely are protecting from someone coming into the data center and stealing the the drive itself, right? But for the online attacker, uh, this data will not be encrypted because uh, the app has an encryption key and it can decrypt everything that goes through the app. So we need to think what is, or should we protect from other users on the same app? Is it sufficient to have access control or maybe we need to have encryption? So it's very, very case specific. And uh, as we as mentioned, we have some measures in, in the app, but it also depends on the platform and depends heavily depends on the use case. Okay, uh, thank you so much. It was a really great presentation. And uh, let's, let's move to the next talk. Babukar, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You can share your screen and start the presentation.
Okay, we can start. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I believe that someone has just, uh, Bobokov has just installed to the updates to the rating system and now they require some permissions. Bobokov, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes, so we can hear you and we can see your screen. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Please put it can, in you can put it in full screen, probably. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Baba Kassise, and I will be talking about um, public portals today, and also in the security of public portals, and a new novel um, approach that we can use to better secure our DHS to public portal middlewares and some best practices. Without further ado, let's get started. Um, we're talking about mainly some use cases, public models, um, current approaches that are being used to implement public portal middleware uh, by the DHS2 community, various ministries of health and wellness, and the problem with this approach and the no novel no, um, next year is server actions that can help. Um, secure, help, better secure our public border living ways, some best practices and some links to some resources. So, um, public portals, as you may already know, um, are not built by the DHS2 core team. It's usually built by the various ministers of health that, that are using DHS2 as their health information system or other entities that are using DHS2. Um, and it's mainly built for data visualization, public data visualization, and making DHS2 data uh, publicly available, shared with the public and partners um, without having those partners or the public having to authenticate, um, having to have a user account on DHS2. So it's just um, deployed on a, on a site the server with a link and anyone with that URL can access the portal and consume the data or visualize the data that's on it. So that's the main purpose of public dashboards, so data visualization, public data visualization portals. Um, so uh, and one other use case um, that we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic was to generate COVID-19 um, vaccine certificates and PCR test results, um, where some countries implemented a um, self-service portal where a citizen or a patient can just can grab their phone number and a unique ID, track, their tracker ID and encode it in some fields and click a button to generate or to generate their certificates. So that's another use case of public portals. Um, the current approach, um, currently about 90% of implementers um, implementing or build that have built public portals are using this approach. And this approach, as you can see, as depicted on the diagram, is mainly having a React application, or it could be built using different technologies, 
uh, protein technologies, but mainly we are to use. And why you have an engine, Nginx reverse proxy or Apache uh, two reverse proxy that sits in between a middleware, what we call a middleware. And this middleware could be built using Node.js, Express, um, or even Java, Go, Lang, it depends on the implementer's preference. But um, its purpose is to just to serve as a mediator and forward requests from the public portal as a client application built with React or any other content technology and forwards that request to the DHS2 instance and gets back, gets the data from the DHS2 instance and and then responses, responds to the um, front end and the front end application that's the public auto displays it in charts, graphs, um, what have you. So um, that's, this is the current main approach, current approach that most implementers are using. And we will see why this middleware is important and why most countries are using it and prefer it over just having a client application. You could do it the easy way, which is not a good practice, which is really bad. That's just having the front end application or React based React or any other front end application and embed your DHS credentials in that client application, which is which can be exposed, will be exposed. Uh, just read the JavaScript code. Um, so this is why most implementers prefer having the credentials um, in the middle world and have the middle world do the communication directly with the DHS instance. So middleware, as I mentioned earlier, just mediators. They just sit in between the client, the public portal, and the data the instance, and they fetch data on behalf of the client application. And also they do the authentication um, with the data instance um, with the respective data um, credentials that's, that's stored in the middleware. Um, they also help with caching, rate limiting, and any other security mechanism that the implementer prefers, um, would like to have implemented or added to their middleware. So these are the main, um, some of the main purposes of the middleware in terms of public portals. And then, but there is a problem, there's an issue with this approach. And one of the issues is unprotected middleware endpoints. Um, most of these middlewares are just um, having fetch data um, and authentication is only done on the middleware between the middleware and the DHS2. So there's no form of authentication or authorization um, on the front end. That's the React or whichever technology the implementer uses for the data public portal data visualization. Um, so um, the problem here is that um, it's kind of security to obscurity uh, because most implementers would um, say that the middleware can't be found. Um, so it's only the front end application that's exposed. So an attacker would only see the front end application and there's no credential embedded in that. So there's no risk, but um, that's not the case. The In reality, um, your middleware, no matter how it's hidden, so long as it's in the cloud it's in the, and it's in the internet and it's accessible by people, uh, it's very easy for attackers to just to locate it um, by using bots to scan the internet and scan IPs, IP ranges. Um, it's a matter of time until they get hold of your middleware IP or domain. And if your middleware endpoints are unprotected, this means attackers can hit any endpoint in the middleware and get data from your DHS2 instance without having to know your DHS2 credentials. So leaving these middleware endpoints unprotected is a problem and this is currently the case and um, needs to be improved on. And as you can see on the screenshot, the screenshot at the top right shows um, an example of a middleware that's in production that's live in production. And this has real DHS to real data and some patient level data. And as you can see, um, an attacker could just hit that endpoint you can see in the screenshot and would have access to a protected DHS2 
um, endpoint. Um, the resources endpoint under normal circumstances, but by default, um, on average, so instance is protected, meaning a user has to authenticate, has to log into the data instance for us to be able to get these endpoints and also to be able to hit any other endpoints. So here, an attacker can just append any of these endpoints, be the track entity instances endpoint or any other endpoint to this and just um, make a good get request and we'll be able to get the data from the data instance. So this is why um, middleware is a good, but having your endpoints using the, your middleware to rely on your middleware to do your authentication and to fetch data on behalf of your public portal and thinking it's secure. It's just security, security through obscurity. So because once the attackers find out, they will be able to get all the data they need from your, from your patients, for instance, for free. So the other thing, the other issue is lack of rate limiting and, and caching. Most of the middleware we've seen lack, lack rate limiting. Uh, they usually are no rate limiting up to, um, configured or implemented. So it means if an attacker, if an endpoint is exposed and an attacker knows one of your endpoints, if they want to cause harm to your system, they could just, you know, be hidden a specific endpoint or different endpoints concurrently, you know, with a heavy amount of traffic. And that alone could cause some performance issues or even take your whole your data system down. And so this is worth um, noting and something to be aware of. Um, that middleware is not the ultimate uh, security solution. Um, if your endpoints are unsecured and you don't have some of these basic security measures in place. And as you can see, as you can see in the screenshot below, this is a code snippet um, that's from a middleware. And this middleware is being used and you can see it's just a good endpoint that can, once an attacker hits this endpoint, they get data without being authenticated. So it's just a matter of them finding out. So what's the solution to this problem? So the solution, um, is a novel approach and leveraging Next.js server actions. Uh, for those that don't know Next.js, Next.js is a React framework um, that enables static site um, generation and server, server site rendering. Um, so it's performant and very and scalable as well, and usually used to build a front end application that's based on, that are based on React. So um, in Next.js 14, uh, Next.js versions before 13, they didn't have server actions and um, server actions were in introduced in version 13, and, but were not stable until version 14. That's when, that's the current version of Next.js and that's when server actions were um, stable and recommended for using production. So, Server actions according to the Next.js documentation, uh, synchronous functions that are executed on the server. And Next.js by default, um, Next.js components are server components unless you um, explicitly um, add a directive, a client, use client directive uh, to, to the component. That's what makes it a client component. But so by default, um, they are server components. And you can also, as you can see on the screenshot below, explicitly add the use server directive. And that's, that makes this whole component a server component and will only run on the server instead of the client. And as you can see, we are passing a header, the authorization header and passing our API key. And we're, we're reading this API key from our environment variable, from an environment variable and you can, as you can see, usually this is not advised if you're using plain React um, without server-side rendering. Um, um, so with this, with Next.js server action, this API key, so long as we specify the use server directive, it's not exposed to the client. And even if an attacker or a curious person reads the JavaScript code, um, in the, in, in the browser, they will be able to find this API key so long as we are um, declaring it in the server action. 
uh, using the sub auction and this new server directory. So um, this is one of the things that could help us um, secure um, our DHS to public portal and for those front end applications and would, as we will see in the next slide, also help us protect our middleware. So the way server actions can help, um, so you can see the two code snippets here. Uh, the first one, the one on the left, helps us call our DHS to endpoints and also add a pendant API key to the request and make sure every request the client application is making um, um, goes with an API key. And this API key is then verified by, by our middleware. Our middleware routes will be protected in this case because we're able to implement to add an API key to our client um, and make sure every request our client makes has this API key included. So this is one of the one of the um, importance of server actions so long, so long as middleware of um, DHS or public products are concerned, helping us embed an API key and making um, authenticated or authorized requests to our middleware. Because you can see on the screenshot, the code snippet on the right um, here, that's the um, client component. Um, and we are um, using the use client directive there, um, which means that it runs on the client and um, it's also rendered on the client, but the one on the left wouldn't um, be wouldn't run on the client, and any secret um, that is embedded there, that's added there, as API key or any other secret, wouldn't be exposed to the client, and even if the um, client side JavaScript um, spread um, code is read, um, it, the API key or any secret embedded wouldn't be exposed. So this is how server actions could help us. Um, improve the security of our DHS and public portals. Um, and this goes a long way, helping us secure the middleware and no API key, then it means no data because the, since the client now sends requests to the middleware with an API and uh, as you can see on the code snippet in, on, the, on the left, um, our middleware is expecting an API key and make sure this API key that the client sends um, is the same API, API key you saw in the previous slide. This API key is verified and you know the crypto module is also used to protect against time, um, time-based attacks, timing attacks. And also if the API key is invalid, it doesn't match the API key that's in the, both API keys should match the one from the client and the one um, in the middleware. So the middleware expects that the API key matches. If it doesn't, then it rejects and um, throws an error, either forbidden or unauthorized. Um, as you can see here, the code snippet on the right is showing us the route um, that's hit. Um, when this route is hit, um, it expects an API key. And then the API key verification logic kicks in and verifies the API key. Some caching is also enabled. It's also, uh, and also that's the, the other directive is the indicators which fetches the data from the data to instance. So this, now this means that we can have, we can now implement middlewares with protected um, API endpoints, protected endpoints. So attackers no longer would be able to abuse our middleware endpoints. If they hit any of the endpoints, in our middleware, provided we have config impl implemented it correctly with no misconfigurations, there would be they would be required to provide an API key. And if an API key is not provided or an API key, the wrong API key is provided, then the request will be rejected and um, no data would be fetched from our DHS, for instance. So this goes a long way from um, in protecting us, you know, could help protect um, against API endpoint abuses and even rate limiting also um, any endpoint that they hit without an API key, no data, then it means it would be very difficult for an attacker to abuse it. So uh, 
some general best practices for public portals. Um, usually nowadays, since we have several actions in Next.js 14, and most public portals are built using React. Um, it's better to just shift to that if if that's if preferred, um, because with server actions, as we, you've seen in the previous slides, you can now have your public portal client you know authenticate every request with an API key, and your middleware will require that API key, and this helps a lot. Um, and API keys, you should keep them secret because this API key it should not be known to anybody because uh, they are secret. Once they are known that it means, or they are stolen or exposed, that it means the person that has them can abuse your middleware endpoints or get data from your data So in instance, unauthorized access, with unauthorized access. So validate input, input validation, on the middleware levels as well, if necessary. Um, there's a, the helmet middleware also, there's a middleware called helmet um, for Express. You could use it in Node.js applications. If your middleware is a Node.js application, you could use this middleware to set security headers. Security headers are very important. Um, they help, especially with the CSP header Content security policy had to help protect against various client side injection attacks, XSS, and the likes. Um, use Next.js if possible um, to benefit from client side caching. Next.js has that built in client side, side um, caching strategy. So using Next.js also helps you leverage that, and this could help you improve the performance of your public portal and your middleware and your data as an instance as well, because if your middleware is abused, then it means this will affect your data as an instance and you would experience performance issues. In fact, some performance issues may be caused by this. Um, so people do face sometimes performance, do face performance issues and often overlook the middlewares or the integration mediators they they're connecting or connected to their data instances. But sometimes if these middlewares or integration uh, mediators are not, you know, secure, then you never know who's having access to what and who's abusing them. So these could be issues and could contribute to performance issues. So it's worth protecting. Look out for client-side security issues like access as well. Uh, apply caching with minimum. IP whitelisting, um, if possible. Um, these are all extra security measures that you could use, that you could implement in on your middleware to help protect against various attacks. So last but not the least, um, here are some resources. If you're interested in digging deeper into Next.js server actions, um, here, here are links to Next.js documentation. Um, I also provide um, prepared um, a POC, a proof of concept, um, implementing, it's just a simple one, just implementing uh, a simple indicators endpoint fetching data from a middleware that's protected with an API key, endpoint that's protected with an API key, uh, and that middleware fetches data from DHS2 and then sends it back to the next year's front end. So um, that's the POE links. Those are the two links. These are uh, they're the two links. The one is one is for the client application, that's the Next.js application, and the other one is for the Node.js middleware. So you can also take a look at that if you're in in our state. Um, server action security best practices also. Next.js has a great blog post about that. You could also dig into that to learn more about server actions and how to secure that. Um, React server components, um, server components uh, what you know, kind of gave birth to server actions without, because without server components, server actions wouldn't have been a thing. Um, so yeah, it's also worth digging into. But that's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhukar. Uh, anyone, questions?
I'm not surprised. Thank you, Babaka. Um, I just wanted to add this is a little bit more of a comment than a question, but there's there's a lot of a lot of good stuff here. There are a few different ways to approach public portals, and it's very good, very very important to consider security when you are thinking about public portals, especially if you are, as in this case, basically exposing a way for the public to uh, to hit your DHS two instance. Right, that can be uh, open up an, a vector of attack maybe that is is not usually there. Um, there, we actually had a session about this last year at the annual conference that had some quite general uh, guidance for if, if you are developing a public portal um, solution, which talks about several of the things that, that Babakar mentioned and, and also things like maybe put all of the public portal, a public publicly accessible data in a dedicated DHS2 instance. So you actually use a, a mechanism to go from your operational instance, which needs to stay online, you then segregate the data that you want to be exposed to the public in in a different place, and then you you let that be the the way to uh, address the yeah uh, to address or to access that from the public. Um, there's also some interesting uh, another proof of concept that one of our engineers Mozafar uh, wrote using Gatsby, uh, which is a little bit of a different approach than using a middleware, but to have uh, basically generate uh, pre-generate some of the visualizations or the 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 um the actual data on a on a schedule on the server so you don't actually expose a direct access to the to the server from from the public but this is a really great uh, example of rate limiting and a lot of those things so thank you very much uh Babukar, for for sharing that um and i encourage people to look at the the material from last year as well um, when looking at public portals it's a very important topic and everybody does it a little bit differently so definitely think about security oh. Thank you. Any questions? No. Good. So let's move to the next talk. And uh, we have uh, a new person in our community. It's Ivy, who is a security intern at DHS2. And uh, she will talk about single sign-on and what we tried and what we managed to do with the different single sign-on solutions. Uh, Ivy, you are very, very welcome. Please. Share your screen and start the presentation. Thank you, Michael. Let's start a slideshow from the start. We see your screen, but in the middle. Uh -huh. We see slide number four. Just this second. Uh, is it okay now? Uh, no, uh, maybe you need to reshare because uh, it looks like it's, it's a bit frozen. Okay. Yeah. Oh, just a second. Good. Now we see this first slide. Okay. Um, hello. Um, my name is Ivy Jokto. I am a security intern at DHIS2. And today we are going to go through comparison and integration guidelines with open source single sign-on solutions for DHIS2. So um, most people are familiar with um, password authentication being the common way of accessing an application where you'd need to input your username and your password. And um, 
you'd require a unique pair of login credentials. And uh, with you accessing multiple applications, you'll be required to keep track of all the credentials. And uh, it becomes a bit cumbersome to manage and also remember the credentials that you have. Um, this brings us to a central authentication system, which allows a user to send their username and password to an application server. And then after it is sent to the application server, it is forwarded to the directory for validation. And an example of the central authentication system is something like Active Directory or LDAP. And um, with this, it has a downside uh, in the sense that if at all the application server becomes uh, compromised, it becomes a security threat because it handles um, the user authentication details. And um, it being a uh, single... Yes? I'm afraid uh, we see all the title slide first. If you try to switch the slides, maybe it's... For, yeah, we, we see the, the first one only. Come. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. You just go to the first one. I think I'll have to stop sharing and uh, share again. And just move to the next one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it okay now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so I was talking about the disadvantages of uh, having a central authentication system where um, for, for the application handling the authentication, it has the user credentials. And if at all it gets, it gets compromised, it becomes a security threat. And, um, it being uh, when when there's a point of failure, it affects the dependent application and be it becomes uh, an issue as well. So um, I'm going to walk you through uh, a flow of how essentially an SSO works. So we have a user who would want to access um, domain one. So they uh, browse- next, next slide. So um, an SSO is an authentication um, an authentication system that an authentication scheme that allows a user to log into different uh, system using a single ID. And uh, when a user logs in once, they don't have to re-enter the authentication details. Um, a major advantage of SSO is that um, it it has uh, it. It provides single authentication event for the SSO server, and um, it uses a single set of credentials. And it's also secure in the sense that um, it does not send my, uh, user detail details multi to, through the network multiple times. And um, the criteria that we used for selecting the SSOs that you are going to discuss today is that uh, it had to be um, open source and uh, actively maintained for the last one year. And another thing is that uh, it supports ID Connect, which is um, more specific to DHIF2. Um, advantage of open source is that uh, it, it is secure in the sense that it can be reviewed um, by the organization before being used. And uh, it is affordable because it is uh, free to use. It has a, open SSOs has, has good community and um, providing support. And it is also customizable to the liking of an organization. So the objective of this uh, presentation today is to compare different SSO tools and to determine the best approach for DHIF2. Um, the case study that we are going to go through today is uh, we have Keycloak, we have PASS, which is Central Authentication Service, we have Canidim, 
and we also have Othelia. So I'm going to start with Kicklock. Kicklock has been uh, maintained and developed by CNCF. It supports um, OpenID Connect or Earth2, um, Samuel and um, LDAP. So uh, for Kicklock, um, it has its own um, admin console uh, and it is highly customizable. An advantage of Kicklock is that it has a good um, documentation that is very clear and it is easy to integrate with, um, with to integrate. It also has um, a very active community and a downside to it is that uh, it, it is complex for beginners. It can be complex for beginners to, to get a hold of. Um, the next one is uh, Central Authentication Service, which um, also provides user authentication and by token generation. It also supports different um, protocols and uh, it is highly customizable to different authentication needs. Um, a good advantage of SAS is that it has a well-structured documentation. And on the downside, uh, it, it is a bit complex and challenging to set up. It also has a limited community and less updates. The documentation is a bit complex to understand. Um, we have Canidim, which of, offers um, central authentication as well. And um, it manages user identity groups and uh, access policy poli policies um, while integrating it with OpenID and OAuth protocols. Uh, for Canidim, uh, it is easy to install and configure. It has a secure and modern look since it's written in, in Rust, and it also has a good um, documentation. So the disadvantages of Canidim is that it is less known at a certain scale. And um, the client application for Ubuntu is not available as opposed to other operating system. Um, if I compare Canidim and Kicklock, Kicklock, um, it can be a standalone or it can be integrated with different identity management systems. It supports, supports OpenID Connect or two SAML protocols and um, Canidim has a lesser protocols that it support, supports um, and Canidim is a bit easier to integrate as compared to Kicklock. Um, we also have Othelia, which adds an extra layer of security um, rather than serving as a comprehensive SSO. So um, it allows a user to auth authenticate using um, 2FA. And um, the advantage of Othelia is that it is simple to configure and integrate. And um, a disadvantage to it is that it has limited features as compared to the um, extensive SSOs and um, it can be, it makes it limiting. Um, the conclusion to this is that open, open source SSO, they provide security and it saves so much on cost. So Kicklock and Canidim have really good community support and comprehensive features. Um, however, uh, SAS uh, shows us the importance of having a good documentation and Othelia has limited features, but it's a bit easy to set up. So the de deliverables for, for this is that um, we are working on our public guidelines to on how to configure SSO tools with um, DHIS2. Thank you. Questions, um, anyone? Any questions? Okay, thank you, Ivy. And uh, we have one more presentation for today. Mm-hmm.
Okay. We can go like this one. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, the last topic for today is uh, heavily technical or and experimental. So we'll talk about logging and uh, how it can work with DHS2. Uh, the topic of uh, logic, logging is uh, like very, very common on our security and general server administration academies. So every time we have an academy, we uh, spend quite a lot of time talking about logging and uh, it's about how to configure DHS2 uh, to work with logs. It's about how to configure other systems and what stack is available. Personally, I've been dealing with uh, logging solutions for roughly 15 years. And every time I get deeper in this topic or I work with a new system, I see that the landscape, landscape is changing and there are a lot of new tools, new technologies. And uh, every time when I play with new tools, I think, okay, I, w I wish I had it to five, 10 years ago. And uh, everything that I work with is quite interesting to dig into and to configure. Uh, this story, this talk is just a short journey of how we configure central logging with DHS2. And uh, at the end, I'll show like uh, and share share the ready snippets for those who would like to repeat and configure it by themselves. So uh, the problem with logging that generally like everyone understands is that it's required. Sometimes it's mandatory for compliance reasons, and if it is not done well, it say uh, it uh, costs a lot of money, uh, it costs system resources, and it is uh, really. Uh, not practically useful if you don't do it right. Um, what kind of log sources are available for the DHS2 ecosystem? First of all, it's uh, DHS2 audit logs. So the logs that show what kind of changes to the data within the system were performed. Second, it's a general application log that shows uh, who has logged into the system, what kind of permissions changed and what uh, happened on the application level. These logs come from Tomcat from the application server. The third thing that is typically used for debugging and for profiling for performance optimizations, it's uh, database logs. At the same point of time, we find it useful that for security purposes, you should always keep at least error log from Postgres and include it into the general analysis of your security environment. The reason for that is that if, for example, there is a SQL injection or any kind of a database uh, attack, uh, tracking the logs on the database level can help to identify potential issues if the protection on the application level doesn't work. Um, then we have a reverse proxy, patch engineers, whatever logs that tell us what kind of requests came from the client side and uh, how they were handled on the front uh, server on the on the reverse proxy. And of course, we have operating system uh, logs that come from syslog or journal D and uh, they show what kind of potential attack vector could happen on the system level. Um, if we look closer to the first two lines, to the DHS2 audit and regular logs, um, we see that uh, it is a plain text file now, and the configuration is as good as uh, supported by Log4j uh, framework, and uh, it can be not only s sending logs to regular text files, it can be any any remote or local source uh, like Apache Cassandra, Kafka, uh, uh, Zero MQ pr protocol, and many more. If you look for look for J documentation, you can find a lot of uh, different use cases how you can ship these logs to remote destinations and how you can process them, transform, and so on. So the even if it is not implemented in the app itself, or is it if this logging is not the default thing. Uh, we can always configure much more than uh, using the configuration file or using the external connectors that come with the Log4j framework, which is the part uh, of the DHS to build. 
So, and the next question is, okay, we have these logs, what should we do next with them? So how we process them and how we build a kind of a performance uh, optimized infrastructure and uh, can serve uh, and process these logs at scale. Um, there are several ch challenges. Every log source, unfortunately, has its own format. And uh, not every log source contain all the information that we need for forensic or investigation or uh, audit uh, trail purposes. So we need to combine different formats somehow, and we need to uh, process these formats as well and uh, get them to the, some kind of a consistent view. Um, this is a proposed uh, way of how we can deploy the logging infrastructure. And uh, on the left, you can see a very typical standalone DHS2 server, and the configuration can be much more complex, but for simplicity and for, for demo purposes, we are taking the kind of a re regular example. So we have a, a Postgres database, we have a regular Tomcat, we have audit logs that come from the system, reverse proxy, and the system logs that come from our syslog. And then we, using open source tools, we deploy uh, database, uh, vector vector process, vector log processor. Uh, there is a mistake, unfortunately, in the slide. It should be not a Postgres. It should be open search, and uh, the open search database and dashboards. So this is another tool that we're using on the another server side. So in, uh, all in all, so we collect logs from different sources and we ship them from the network to the vector log processor. It's a tool that helps us to process and unify the logs, and then everything goes to the central storage database, and then we can use dashboards to display and search and uh, create alerts and uh, uh, analyze uh, the log data. So the tools are, uh, that we use are open search. It's a database and a dashboard for non-structured data uh, or no-scale database. Uh, it's an open source uh, replacement for Elasticsearch and Kibana uh, stack, so many of you probably know that the license for Elasticsearch has changed and it is not publicly available or it's not that free to use that it has been for many, many years. And Vector is a recent, a quite new tool uh, that was developed originally by Datadog uh, and open sourced. It's a tool for receiving, processing and uh, sending uh, logs uh, further on. And uh, using this combination of these two tools, you can build a super efficient uh, memory, low memory footprint and uh, very flexible uh, pipeline for processing logs. Um, user interface. So you have, uh, if you look into the dashboards, it's our demo dashboards that we have at uh, DHS2 infrastructure, own infrastructure. So it has all typical things for searching logs. You can see processing. There is an example of audit logs that we process. And uh, you can, for example, view surrounding logs for this event. And you can look for any event that has happened in, in time. And you can analyze the series events. So all st standard features that exist in the tool. And of course, you can make dashboards. You can create uh, different alerts and notifications based on that. On the top of that, uh, there is a thing which is called security alerts, and uh, open search comes with a set of predefined security rules that uh, can be trained or can be attached to the incoming log flow. So you literally out of the box receive a really good and community curated list of security alerts that cover most of the like well-known threats. Uh, the total amount of alerts is roughly about 3,000. Uh, I just showed some exam examples of that, uh, but they can be easily configured, uh, included into the analysis, and then you can just uh, get the uh, notification via messengers, email, uh, or any other way, webhook, whatever, just to um, react, react on them. Um, we have uh, two links to share today. So the first one, it is a reference script for reference installation of DHS2, and it has all configs for this login configuration, what can be done on the server side. So if uh, you or your team's assignments 
would like to uh, dig into that. Everything is public there, and you can just use the configuration snippets to configure logging on your site. And the second is a uh, uh, Docker Compose configuration and config for vector that allows you to bootstrap a fully functional console for processing logs in like three minutes. That's all from me. If you have any questions, please ask. This one? Uh, the presentations are available in the folder and which is linked to the agenda, so you can just download it from there. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I tried to be as short as possible because the first one was very long. Okay, thank you. Then, um, if you don't have any questions, that's all for today with this session. And if you would like to discuss any other topics, we're here around uh, to chat.